Hello there, everyone. Uh, my name is John Lustria. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, and I'm very happy to be joined today uh, by historian Ron Coddington. Welcome, Ron. Hey, John. Thanks so much. You're delighted to be here. Yeah, we're, uh, we're glad to have you. And not only are we glad to have you, we're glad to have all of you. Yes, yes. you. Uh, out there watching right now. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you on this Friday, uh, and we hope that uh, if you like the video, um, you'll consider liking the video uh, <laughs> and sharing it around, telling your friends about it, uh, spreading the word so uh, more people can hop on and, uh, and watch us today. Um, and uh, go ahead and, and uh, drop in the comments maybe where you're watching from. I, I know we've had a number of regular viewers throughout the, uh, throughout the pandemic. It's been wonderful to uh, kind of get to know some folks. And uh, we have some very exciting news today that I'm going to announce uh, in just a little bit. I'll probably announce it uh, maybe a couple times throughout the, the broadcast. Let's see, we got Paige here commenting, um, checking in from Louisiana. Very exciting. Uh, hey, thanks, for being, thanks for being with us. Um, let's see, Colleen from New Jersey. Um, Colleen. We got our, um, let's see here, uh, another Dan from Cedarsville, New Jersey. Gary from Ellicott City, Maryland. Excellent. We're starting to get get some people on the stream here. It's wonderful to, to see all of you. Thanks um, for spending your afternoon or, or an hour of your afternoon with us. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we got Wendy from Telford, um, Laura from Martinsburg. Um, excellent. Uh, Marsha from Potomac, Maryland. Excellent. My, even my wife has deigned to join uh, us today. Uh, <laughs> honored. <laughs> have all right. of you here. All of you. That's right. Um, so as more and more people are, are hopping on, um, again, want to thank you uh, for doing so. Uh, please consider liking the video. That kind of boosts our engagement, helps more people see it. Uh, consider sharing the video. Uh, and uh, I'm here to announce something really exciting. I know um, a lot of you have tuned in for a lot of our programs. I'm seeing some familiar names uh, popping in the comments here. But I am very excited to announce that a week from today, Friday, June 26th, you will be able to come and visit us live in person at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, initially, we're just going to be open uh, Friday through Sundays uh, from 10 to 5. Um, and all of you who perhaps have become members uh, throughout the, the pandemic, and there's a lot of you, and we've been so blessed um, by you supporting us in that way. Uh, if you've become a member, uh, come on in and in introduce yourself. Uh, you get free admission, of course. Um, so we, we'd love to meet you. Um, we will be taking walk-ins, although we encourage you to call in and, and um, you know, tell us when you're coming, reserve a time, uh, and things like that. You can go see our website for details uh, on all of our policies and things, but you can rest assured we're taking every precaution recommended by the CDC, by the state of Maryland, uh, and all that stuff. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have masks, hand sanitizer, uh, and, and all manner of other things. Again, our, our website has uh, more details about that. So we'll be very excited to welcome you back um, a, a week from now, uh, if indeed you're comfortable coming in. Um, and if you've been uh, tuning in for our videos, which have been going on for, who my, um, a little bit over three months now, um, and, and you haven't yet become a member and, and you've enjoyed them, um, it would mean the world to us if you, um, as perhaps a thank you um, for, for doing all these, it would be, we'd be so thankful if you consider becoming a member if you can. If not, no worries. Uh, the best thing you can do, um, is is like the video and that that counts for something so um it's been a joy getting to know you and if you're concerned that these videos might go away you don't have to be concerned um they of course will continue to exist on facebook and youtube and we will continue to do these um we'll continue to do these videos even while the museum's open we've been doing them three days a week starting in july we're going to dial that back to about two times a week uh and then we'll go from there um, but yes, never fear. Those of you that can't come in, um, 
to the museum in person, we will still bring the museum to you uh, as much as we can. So uh, thanks again so much for, for tuning in and thanks for, as Ron said, spending a little bit of your afternoon uh, with us today. Uh, and if you have any uh, questions uh, or anything, uh, drop them in the comments, um, either about reopening or um, what we're going to talk about with Ron today, uh, which is uh, all of his incredible research uh, for a forthcoming book about Civil War nurses. Mm -hmm. um, so with all that said, let's go ahead and, uh, and get into it here, Ron. So sure. uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, how you got into Civil War history and some of the cool digital things that you have been doing during the pandemic. Sure. Um, my, uh, a lot of credit to my mother. Um, uh, when I was, yes, this is to mom. Uh, when I was, uh, we were growing up, my two brothers and I, um, we were big on uh, weekend day trips to see various um, sites uh, in New Jersey and the surrounding area. And um, one of those trips was to Gettysburg, uh, the classic Gettysburg experience. Um, I still can't really explain um, what about it grabbed me, um, but I was, it, it grabbed me um, full on. And uh, I started to get a, an appreciation for Civil War history. Uh, it wasn't until a, a few years later that um, I, on one of those other weekend trips to a flea market, uh, I began to notice uh, these stacks of old photographs. And um, that really caught my attention. I was a budding artist wanting to learn how to draw portraits. And so uh, I started to develop a routine where I would buy a photograph on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, you know, try my best to draw. I was a 14 year old kid. Um, and I uh, started collecting, uh, and uh, I found the Civil War photographs most intriguing because these were images that I couldn't find in my history books. Um, these were portraits of, of soldiers uh, and sailors, uh, of women, children, and uh, I really became fascinated by that, and I can talk more about photography in context to the Civil War in a little bit. Um, but that got me going, uh, and I became a pretty heavy-duty collector um, all through high school, through college. Um, uh, it wasn't really until um, I was in my late 30s that I had the idea of realizing a boyhood dream to write a book. I went to my collection, I picked out a bunch of images, and I was really basing my selections on aesthetics, had never written a book before. And I thought, okay, a book can't just have pictures, it needs to have captions, right? <laughs> that, that's, how, that's how I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So um, I looked at the photograph on top of the stack and up to that point, I really hadn't paid much attention to who they were. I was just interested with the fascinating details of their uniforms their faces and all of that. So I flipped the image over and his name was on the back. I researched his story and I, what I learned about him opened up a window into understanding the Civil War through his eyes uh, and led to where I am today. Um, a fascination with connecting the soldier and sailor stories and nurses stories um, to the social threads, the political threads, the military threads, and really just telling those stories, trying to remember that these folks were, they were human beings, they were Americans at a time of a great and massive tragedy that was tearing apart the very fabric of our civilization. Uh, and I feel like if we get to know them, um, and get to see what they saw and how they reacted, that'll help us. So that fascination is with me. Uh, lasted through um, now five books uh, with the forthcoming nurses book. And uh, then a magazine, uh, Military Images, which I became editor and publisher of in 2013. And like you guys uh, at the museum, trying to make sure that our outreach is continuing 
to the Civil War community, the Civil War collecting community, and others who have an interest in the Civil War through um, our uh, Facebook um, site, Military Images. Uh, we have a, a, a bi-weekly program called um, uh, Military Images Live, where I tell stories and we go down the research rabbit hole. Uh, we have a new program called Caretakers, which are um, uh, collectors come on and talk about their collection and what inspired them. So um, uh, we're doing uh, very similar things uh, to you to try to keep engaged. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, and while the yeah. pandemic, of course, has been immensely challenging, there have yeah. been some really kind of delightful opportunities to, to connect with other yeah. people. Um, you yes. know, things like this being one of them. So, yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm a big believer in the idea that um, you have to go where the conversations are happening. And uh, mm -hmm. right now they're happening here. So we're here. <laughs> That's right. That's a, a, a great insight. Go where the conversations are happening. Um, you sort of alluded to this a little bit. I want to uh, dive into it a, a bit more. Part of, I think, your enjoyment with photographs is, um, I mean, you hear the expression, put a face uh, on the Civil War. Uh, but in the case of photographs, they quite literally do put a face to it. And you, know, you get to know these people a little bit as individuals. Um, and so my, my question is this, uh, why photographs? What is about them that makes them so poignant in the study of the Civil War, do you think? Mm. Um, for me, uh, partly it's a, you have to understand the context. Photography is invented in 1839 uh, by a gentleman named Daguerre. Uh, he uh, develops this amazing, it's, it's the first commercially successful photograph that has such an impact on the world um, because the idea of capturing an image, a likeness, with light, uh, phosphorus chemicals, a camera obscura, all these uh, 18th and early 19th century ideas come into play. Uh, I can't emphasize how shocking the discovery of photography was to the world. Uh, France gave it away um, in the interest of humanity. They didn't patent it. They didn't put a monetary value on it. They gave the technology away. Within a month, it's in the United States. Oh, wow. Uh, I know. The growth of photography is phenomenal. And of course, we we put we do our American thing. You know, We make it more affordable. We democratize it. Um, uh, and that art form is significant because it is really only a single piece of art, one camera, one development, and you got it, this is yours. It's not until a bit later on that this idea of making a print from a glass negative uh, becomes a thing. And uh, Nowadays, it sounds like a no-brainer, right? It's like, oh, yeah. And nowadays, that technology is out of date because my phone right here can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea of making multiple copies from a photograph, all of this starts happening in the late 1850s, very late 1850s, right on the cusp of the Civil War. Meanwhile, military photography got its start in America um, during the um, War with Mexico in the late 1840s. Um, it, was a, it was not a systematically photographed war. It was, um, you know, whatever photographer was in a town that the armies were marching through, got up on the roof, took some photos. Um, it's not until the Crimea in 1856, uh, which, by the way, you see Florence Nightingale start to uh, make her way into all of this. Um, that's the first systematically photographed war. The Civil War is systematically photographed. We know it from the battlefield photos, which of course were popular during the war itself. Um, but the images that I'm interested in, the portraits, these are never intended for public consumption. Um, but because of the technology of making multiple copies from a glass negative, these tiny images about the size of tr modern trading cards, in fact, they're called cartes de visite, uh, our collectors call them CDVs for short, they became all the rage coincident with the In 65, 
SUVs take over the market. This idea, um, uh, can you? Yeah, you're, you're cutting in and out a little bit there. Uh, the, um, by the 1860s in the Civil War, the courts to visit the CDVs, they become all the rage in America. It's really Facebook of the 1860s. And mm. so that's, that's, that's the context that fascinates me because if you know that, then you understand that men, women, children, getting their photograph Right, that was a, a huge deal. Looks like you cut out there a, a little bit again, Ron. Bear with us uh, here for a second, folks. Hopefully, uh, Ron will uh, come back. Uh, just popping over to the comments here, I see um, we, we have a number of good questions coming in. Uh, John Willen asks uh, if there's uh, any idea when Clara Barton will reopen. Um, uh, and he didn't ask, but the implicit question is about the, uh, the Pry House. Um, not yet. Uh, hard to say. DC is uh, a little bit further behind um, the uh, the other end. And, and there goes Ron. Hopefully he'll find his way back on here. All right, we're back. Uh, Ron's back. I uh, was just answering. I popped over the comments, uh, tackling a question from John Willen about uh, any word whether our other sites will reopen. They will eventually. Hard to say when exactly, but we're trying to stay in keeping with some of the you know, all the, all the guidelines we need to follow. So the other sites not open yet, but stay tuned for more info on that. Um, welcome back, Ron. <laughs> uh, sorry for the delay. Oh, no worries. Uh, you were saying about how uh, the CDVs, these little portraits were sort of like the Facebook of their time. Yeah, they really are. It's social media. Um, there's a massive explosion. It, mass media is really coming of age in the 1850s and 1860s. And uh, the ability to have these images, um, your face um, in a photo album, which by the way, were invented to hold CDVs, um, to have your face on one page, and then maybe the face of Abraham Lincoln next to you, instantly democratizes Americans. It's it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, Photoshopping yourself in next to a celebrity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, ex exactly, exactly. But the power in photography, of photography, to do that um, really is beginning during the Civil War period in America. Very cool. Uh, and, and I know uh, a lot of your books have focused uh, heavily on, on photography, um, perhaps all of them. Yeah. Um, um, talk about, you know, how you got on the subject of, of Civil War nurses and, and, and then by extension, then talk a, a bit about the book that's coming up. Sure. Um, I should say that I really come into the books backwards in a way. I do the photo research first. Um, they're, they're very photo driven in the beginning. Uh, and then after I have found the photographs, then I will do the, the research to be able to, to tell their story. So uh, um, I have to admit, when I did my first book with uh, Johns Hopkins, I had no expectations to do anything more. And so you can imagine my surprise when my editor, uh, Bob Brueger, who's now retired, um, asked me what I wanted to do next. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> next? What do you I mean? know, I know. I just got one done. Um, and, uh, and so he actually encouraged me to do, uh, to explore women as a topic. Uh, and I wasn't, I wasn't sure where to find the research at that point in time. So I sort of put it on, on the back burner. But I had another experience. My very first book event was a book festival in Baltimore. And um, a woman came up to the table and she looked through the book. Uh, very, very carefully. And then she handed it back to me with a, a single comment. And she said, you know, there are men of color who fought in the Civil War. And it was in that moment that I realized that no matter what I had done in the introduction to explain 
how rare African-American photographs were and that I didn't have any in my personal collection at that time, the book only had my collection, that they were not included. It didn't matter to her because she did not see um, a person of color. And so I knew then and there that I had to think differently about what I was doing. And that led me to re-examine what more books would be like. Um, and I thought, well, this is really an opportunity to capture photography, but it's also an opportunity to capture different narratives around the war, again, through the eyes of the people. So that's what led me to, um, from Union soldiers to Confederate soldiers, uh, to African-American um, participants, to uh, Navy and then to nurses. So, uh, so that, that's, that's the path. Um, and the nurses book was actually supposed to um, be out in April, but uh, um, due to the pandemic, like many things, is uh, on hiatus until October. But I spent the better part of three, two to three years actually doing all the research and the writing for it. Wow, that's, uh, that's not an insubstantial amount of time. Um, and and um, I'll now go over to the comments because we've gotten a number of pretty good questions good. Um, about nursing and nursing care. And then, and then uh, uh, I'm very excited about this. You've brought um, some photographs with you yeah. uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get specific and we'll take a look at some of those. Good. Um, let me see here. Uh, Barbara asks, uh, what illnesses uh, slash problems did the nurses have to deal with, uh, such as malaria, lice, dysentery, other? Um, talk mm -hmm. a little bit about uh, the stuff that they come in close contact with. Yeah, uh, great question, Barbara. Um, diseases, everything and anything you can imagine. Um, childhood diseases, or diseases we think of childhood diseases, measles, uh, and then, of course, malaria yellow fever, smallpox, um, uh, dysentery. It's all, any, almost anything you can imagine. Uh, and all this relates to the fact that you've got regiments that are being formed that are coming into camp. Um, a lot of these uh, young kids uh, haven't been immunized. They have been maybe local to their area, not exposed to various parts of the country. Um, so every regiment uh, on either side of the army has to go through this period of sort of uh, um, winnowing out uh, men who wind up falling sick, sadly dying. And then of course there's the, the injuries that they face uh, or that they encounter from battle. Um, some of the, well, not some, all of the um, narratives that I have read by the women or by those writing in primary source documents, um, the care of uh, post-operative wounds, I think in particular, uh, the, sort of the, the pre-op and the post-op, um, what, what they, they were right in the middle of all this, whether assisting or afterwards um, helping to helping the soldier or sailor in his recovery. Uh, I, I don't know that I can give you all the words to describe it. Um, it's, it's truly the horrors of war. And the women that I write about were right in the middle of all of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, another good question here from Marsha. Uh, where were the Civil War nurses trained? Marsha, great, great question. Um, I, there's no, um, John, you might speak to this uh, better than I can, but in my investigations, um, uh, it's very inconsistent. Um, in New York, uh, there's some good opportunities for training, um, maybe in some of the larger cities, certainly early in the war, um, but I find a mix of folks who sort of learned, you know, at home, uh, taking care of family. Um, Florence Nightingale's book has literally just come out. Um, if you go to newspapers.com and do a search for her book, uh, it's spiking right at the beginning of the Civil War in popularity, at least in the newspapers. And, uh, and so, you know, women are reading this, they're trying to understand how to, how to make 
something literally out of nothing. Um, I should add that uh, unlike men who have a clear, there's a clear path. You want to become involved in the war, you go to your local recruiter, you sign up. Whether you're going to be on the crew of a ship or in a company that joins a regiment, you have a path. It's very clear. If you're a woman and you want to be involved as a nurse, especially in the beginning, you're kind of on your own. <laughs> now that changes a little bit over time, but it never, never approaches uh, the, the kind of organization that the military has. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Uh, training uh, for nurses is uh, rare and very inconsistent. And I, I should add that even for the, the surgeons, um, nobody is prepared for what they're about to walk into. And, yes. and we, we use the example of, uh, of Dr. Jonathan Letterman, um, you know, just an incredible innovator of Civil War medicine. Before the yeah. Civil War, uh, Letterman had treated more arrow wounds than he had gunshot wounds. Mm -hmm. And that experience mm -hmm. was not uncommon for doctors. Yeah. So, so nobody is prepared. Um, yeah. And, but yeah, training is uh, rare and inconsistent. Yeah. Um, so, and there's uh, tons of great questions in the comments. We'll, we'll do what we can uh, to, to get to all of them, but I also want to make sure we get to some of these photographs. So, Ron, do you want to uh, show us uh, a few and, and talk a bit about them here? Sure. Let me uh, share the screen. This one did. All right. Fantastic. So who are we looking at here? All right, we're looking at uh, Helen uh, Gilson, and uh, she is um, she's in many ways like a, a Clara Barton, um, sort of follows that same path. She's working locally to get supplies uh, up in Massachusetts and bring them down to the front lines. Um, she has. Um, uh, uh, quite a story to tell about her experiences. Um, I could easily spend an entire hour talking about her alone, but I'll, I'll give you very quickly this uh, one story in June of 1864 when City Point, the Union base in City Point, is um, uh, getting up and organized. A number of uh, African American soldiers come in from the US colored troops. And uh, the long and short of it is none of the nurses want to volunteer um, to help these men. Uh, and she steps in and uh, everybody warns her. They're afraid for her life. They're, they're fearful. Uh, uh, a lot of this because of they don't know what they don't know. Uh, they have heard various rumors, but she is not one who's going to listen to them. She's an independent spirit independent spirit. And uh, um, she replies to one of the nurses who was warning her. She says that she could not die in a cause more sacred, uh, talking specifically about going in to help these men of color who were laying down their lives um, for freedom. It's a powerful story and she's a powerful woman. She tragically dies in childbirth in 1868. Mm. Wow, that that that's a that's a great quote, incredibly moving, um, yeah. and and just to clarify for people out here that the um, people watching the the pictures you're going to show us, um, how many of these are are published? I think the answer is zero. I uh, actually some of them have been published, okay. um, but uh, not uh, there's a number of them that have not been. So. Um, I'm going to go through, I've, I've selected, I have 77 altogether in the book. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm mindful of time. So I'll try to go through these 12. I think I've selected 12 altogether. Fantastic. So, um, this is uh, Almira Fails. And uh, she sort of is, the, is dressed, this is sort of the quintessential nurse in some ways. Uh, she doesn't, there's no prescribed uniform. Uh, I, I commonly encounter in my reading um, women with baskets, always with baskets of stuff. Uh, and so here she has baskets of food, looks like fresh bread, condiments. Uh, she has a long 
uh, career in the, in the army during the war, the army service. But one thing I'll mention her is about her is early on, after Lincoln is elected president, this is November of 1860, um, she reacts by going home and beginning to make bandages, lots of them. And this is 1860, the war isn't starting for months yet. And townspeople are thinking, what is going on? And she was so prescient. She knew where this was going and she was prepared way, way, way in advance. Wow. That story stays with me. Absolutely. Um, here's a wonderful uh, portrait. This was taken uh, at some point during a break uh, at Gettysburg. Uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. Letterman. Uh, oh, that's Sally, that's yeah, Sally Dysart uh, is uh, on the left um, reading, uh, it's like a news magazine perhaps or a monthly magazine. Wonderful photograph. Uh, Annie Bell, um, who you may have heard of, uh, she comes to prominence. She's in the center looking with her hand over her forehead. Uh, and then Sarah Chamberlain, lesser known nurse, is on the right. They were all at Gettysburg. And, and, uh, and I'm, I, I can already hear the question forming in people's mind. I'm, I think Sarah has <laughs> no, no, no relation to Joshua Chamberlain. Uh, no. <laughs> Good point, though. Um, but uh, what struck me about Sally is she's motivated to join uh, in 1861, when President Lincoln, or I should say President-elect Lincoln is passing through Harrisburg on his way to Washington, and um, she listens to him speak, and she's awestruck, uh, and she says, all that was good was with him. There was no bad. Her life journey goes on from there. This is Catherine Lawrence. Uh, she's here with Rebecca, um, the slave child that she more or less adopted. Um, she was working, um, Catherine Lawrence was working in DC at the time, um, had a number of run-ins with Dorothea Dix, two massively strong-willed women going up against one another. Uh, Catherine Lost um, was put in some of the worst hospitals in DC, eventually uh, gets moved over to Virginia and she meets Rebecca. A journey begins. Uh, they go to New York to get baptized. Uh, Henry Ward Beecher um, makes a big stirring speech about them, launches a tour through the northeastern states. Uh, and this is one of the images that she sold to make money to support their travels and to support her new family. Um, this idea of using photographs for philanthropy is born during the war. It, uh, just a quick follow-up question on that. You, yeah. you mentioned like, you know, this is a photograph that they would use to, to sell. Who, do we have any idea who's buying these pictures and, and why they might feel they, they want this? Or is it like, I, I'm buying this to support this person kind of thing? It's probably both. Um, I, you find these images ultimately are winding up in albums and mm -hmm. photo albums. Uh, and so they are part a memory of the war, a reminder of the war, a personal connection um, they may have had, or as you say, they're inspired by this person's story. The photographs you're probably most familiar of are of um, soldiers who have suffered an amputation who are out selling their photographs for 25 cents or so to make money in addition to their pension. So in those cases, there's probably an added sympathy for the soldier who um, gave an arm or a leg in service of the, of the Union. Uh, this is uh, Anna Etheridge, um, Gentle Annie, Michigan Annie. Um, she is uh, probably one of the nurse names that you know. Um, she is, she's sort of the stuff of legend. Um, there are many stories that I could, that I think, I believe are true about her being close to the front lines, coming into harm's way. Uh, but there are also fantastical stories 
um, of her on a horse leading charges, holding the, the Star Spangled Banner, um, you know, basically becoming a, a colonel uh, leading the regiment into battle. Uh, none of those are true. Um, but uh, she was, in fact, a very reticent woman, uh, had a, a certain kind of a pride. She really was interested in enduring the hardships with the soldiers, but she kept them at arm's length. Um, she traveled with them. Um, she was very interested in the progress of the war, an avid reader. And um, you'll notice in this particular image, she's wearing um, a decoration, a military decoration. Um, that's the Carney Cross, one of two um, that were given to women uh, by General Phil Carney, or I should say, after his death, um, they were awarded in his name. And so I did find an account that said that she didn't want to wear the medal. Um, she sort of shunned the medal, um, but this photograph would tell us otherwise. And uh, I, I've seen a couple people asking who some of these specific people are. After the video is over, it will continue to exist on the Facebook page. So you can go back and watch through and, and catch the name if, if you missed it and you wanna make sure you, you wrote it down. Yes, and I'm also, I'll make myself available. Uh, you can contact me and I'm happy to fill in details um, as needed. Uh, this is a carte de visite, but it's in a velvet uh, or a, a fabric frame. Very and uh, this, Oh yeah, very, quite fancy. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Debbie Hughes. She had studied uh, um, at the Female Medical College in Pennsylvania, earned a degree in uh, 1856. When the war starts, she immediately gets involved as a nurse, and um, she might have gone on to much bigger and better things. But in November of 1861, just months into the war, she goes home to Pennsylvania. She decides to go to uh, Camp Wayne to bring supplies to soldiers, and a carriage accident results in injuries that prove mortal for her. Mm. Anna M. Ross of Philadelphia. This is, I have to say, uh, this story still sticks with me in a really big way. Um, she was involved in the Cooper Union Hospital uh, in Philadelphia in 61, and uh, she gets almost no credit. Um, if you start to search, uh, you find, why isn't she mentioned anywhere? But then you start to find the narratives and the tributes. This image, by the way, you'll notice at the bottom has the copyright on it. Um, in 1864, it was sold uh, to support uh, efforts for a new hospital that she founded. In doing so, she became, she basically exhausted herself. And the hospital was dedicated, it was a grand dedication ceremony in Philadelphia on December 22nd, 1861, the same day she died. Oh, wow. She did not, she could not, not attend because she was so ill and she died. Uh, she gave, she literally gave her life to um, establish a hospital um, for soldiers. Yeah, well, and it, it uh, brings to mind the, the famous phrase from the Gettysburg Address, the last full measure of devotion. Um, yeah. And of course, that was pictured in all manner of ways on, on battlefields, but it, it, it even goes beyond the battlefield. Um, Absolutely. There, there's many ways to express it. And Anna Ross uh, has, uh, she's uh, just uh, a, 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 an icon in my mind. Mary Morris' husband uh, is, uh, she's pictured here. If you look at first glance, it looks like her hand might be missing, um, but it's actually in her pockets. Uh, and I titled the story Pocket Full of Miracles because that's what the soldiers said about her. As I mentioned earlier, there's no uniform that nurses have. So some of them invented their own, whatever they were comfortable with. And this is Mary's version of that. It's sort of a comfortable dress. Um, and she has this big apron that she's wearing over it, this light colored apron. The pockets are huge. And uh, she put all kinds of stuff in there to distribute to the soldiers. 
You'll also notice her hat, which has uh, an Army Corps badge, the third Army Corps badge, which is uh, the Corps uh, with which she was associated with during um, all of her time uh, as a nurse. Was that common for uh, nurses to sort of uh, either attach themselves of their own accord or, or through some formal channels? Was that common for uh, nurses to be associated with units? I saw more of it than I expected to see. Um, women would go to a certain place. Uh, for example, Mary's case, she shows up. She was a local aid society and goes to Antietam is at Smoketown Hospital, uh, sort of on her own. You know, she's working with a group. Uh, no one says go there. She's like, let's just go. Uh, and so I see a lot of that. Um, uh, there's a wonderful note of her uh, at Smoketown Hospital. It says um, her presence at this hospital brought perpetual sunshine and uh, also notes that she made a flag for her tent by sewing upon a breath of calico, a figure of a bottle cut out of red flannel. And the bottle flag flew to the wind at all times, indicative of the medicines which were dispensed from the tent below. I love that. That's great. <laughs> uh, and there's all on her uh, apron, um, the, there's a comment about her deep wide pockets, all stored full of something which will benefit or amuse her boys. An apple, an orange, an interesting book, a set of chessmen, checkers, dominoes, puzzles, newspapers, magazines. She had it all. <laughs> That's right. Kind of a Mary Poppins vibe there. You never know what's going to uh, yes. come out of the pockets. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, this is an image that back when I started the book, this, was, this image was all over the internet. Um, there wasn't that many nurses images at the time. We're going back only a few years at this point. But this one intrigued me because I couldn't find the original. And it took me forever to track it down to the University of Arizona. Uh, and so I was able to get um, a high quality reproduction. Uh, she is Georgie Bacon. Um, Georgiana, her full name, Georgiana, Nierson Wolsey Bacon. Um, she writes a book. It's actually a pamphlet. Um, it's not that long. It's called Three Weeks at Gettysburg, and it details her experience. Um, I highly recommend giving it a read. Now, I will tell you, there's a couple, she has some attitudes towards race um, uh, that are not particularly, will not go over well necessarily in this period of time, but her, what she has to say about her experience is really um, quite powerful. And uh, she talks about, I wanna give you this one, um, one quote here. She says, uh, she describes a wounded Confederate. She says that she found him lying on his blanket stretched over the straw, a fair haired, blue eyed lieutenant, a face innocent enough to one of our own New England boys. I could not think of him as a rebel, he was too near heaven for that. Mm. And she goes on to then talk about how difficult uh, in other writings, she talks about it was difficult for her to be able to um, sort of come to terms with taking care of Confederates. She also talks a lot about literally breaking through the sort of the, not literally breaking through the glass ceiling, dealing with surgeons who were hostile to having women uh, as nurses. Hmm. and the process and the struggles and the tribulations that she and her sister nurses had to go through to be able to prove themselves. Um, she really writes, writes eloquently about that in another narrative that she writes with one of her sisters. Let's see, okay. Uh, this is Sybil Jones. Um, she's a Quaker and she's no ordinary Quaker. She and her husband, Eli, are kind of the dream team. Um, Eli is the bookish biblical scholar. She is an amazingly charismatic speaker. Their travels take them throughout the world before the war. Hmm. When the war begins, their son decides that he's going to join the army. This, of course, creates a huge challenge for the family's faith. 
These are people of peace, right? Uh, they're, you know, they're friends. Uh, and so that this famous couple's son would decide to go and actually pick up a weapon and harm human beings is anathema. They, despite all of that, they managed to write letters to each other. He dies at the Battle of Fort Stevens in DC. Up until this time, Sybil is not exactly, she's, she's, she's sort of touching on the war, but she's not really involved with it. After his death, she sort of finds, she sees the light and she goes on a tour of hospitals to serve and of course to spread the word um, of her faith. Wow. Yeah. And so I've got a, just two more to show you. Um, Sister Ignatius Farley, she's a young woman, one of the youngest uh, nuns in Wheeling, uh, Virginia to become West Virginia. And um, soldiers are coming in to the church. Uh, the church becomes more or less a makeshift hospital uh, as the Union Army is moving. Eventually, they establish a hospital in town. But during the time she's in the hospital, she and her, nun, her sister nuns are taking care of these men who are in the, the you know, they're in the main sanctuary and places like that. And um, here's a quote that I just, it just stays with me. Um, she walks in to an anteroom off of the main sanctuary and she sees, there's a scene before her. She says, I stood fascinated by the unusual picture of seven sisters worn out from severe hospital duty who were lying asleep on the floor and soldier fashion, each sister was enfolded in a blanket while each wary head was resting upon a pillow made of leaves gathered on the campus. Over the sleeping group, which included the superior, there rested the soft roseate glow from the sanctuary lamp gleaming through the glass panels of the closed door, and there was still lingering the delicate fragrance of the incense used in the adjoining chapel for an evening benediction. Hmm. What, a, what a wonderful picture, and certainly it uh, engages some of the senses there uh, with the, the description of the lights and the, and the incense. I mean, that's, that's great. That's a great account. Yeah. Really, just, just absolutely beautiful, and to imagine these uh, exhausted nuns, uh, more or less camping out on the floor of this anteroom is just powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, the last image I have for you, uh, this is uh, Rosanna Billing. And um, she's a frail, no question, she's a frail youth. Uh, and when the war begins, her parents are, they really are discouraging her from going because they know of her health issues. Um, but she's not, she's not going to have any of this. And uh, she goes off and, uh, and becomes a nurse. Uh, she's in Falls Church, Fredericksburg, winds up at the uh, Naval School Hospital in Annapolis, uh, where she contracts uh, typhoid. And uh, uh, word of her illness and her eventual death makes the round throughout the Corps of Nurses. One nurse hears about this and knows a little bit about her story, though has never, never met her. Um, and this nurse that hears the story is named Walt Whitman. And Walt Whitman says, a lady named Miss Billing, who has long been a practical friend of soldiers and a nurse in the army, has become attached to it in a way that no one can realize but him or her who has had the experience was taken sick early this winter, lingered some time, and finally died in the hospital. This is January of 1865 when she passes. Hmm. Whitman added, it was her request that she should be buried among the soldiers and after the military method. Her coffin was carried to the grave by soldiers with the usual escort, buried, and a salute fired over the grave. 
Wow. Again, talk about a moving description. A lot, a lot of yeah. really moving quotes and stories associated with uh, with these women. Wow. Yeah, I, I, it really fascinates me because it's almost uh, the the in the moment these soldiers treating her as one of their own. Uh, these are not the it's not the civil war that you necessarily think about. Uh, and so it's, I, I see this over and over and again, the bonding that has happened between the nurses and the soldiers is really compelling. Mm, absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing uh, all of those really incredible images. Um, I mean, uh, as we were saying earlier, it really does put a face to the war. Um, and and especially to uh, to Civil War nursing, uh, and I know you know those twelve not only just scratch the surface of what you present in your book, but on the experience of all Civil War nurses. And, and uh, I believe uh, I saw this was a question in the comments. You know how many total women served, and I, I think it's you know well over twenty thousand. Is that correct? I, I, I think that that's one estimate. There are several estimates. Um, I believe if you go to the um, National Archives, you'll find something um, or between two and 3,000 pensions on file. Um, nurses did receive pensions at some point after the war. So um, that would be a low number compared to the 20,000. But because the, uh, because the system, the record keeping, for nurses isn't as complete as the army, uh, it's really hard to tell. Um, and, uh, and that's especially true when you factor in nurses in the South, uh, where there was nowhere near the organization that the, the nurses had in the North, and the nurses in the North had very little organization, really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just kind of go going through the comments here, um, Maureen asks, um, what do we know about the, the death rate um, for nurses that serve from disease or injury? And my guess is uh, we probably know very little because of what you were just talking about. Yeah, um, very little. Um, I, I, um, if you want to count the statistical, uh, the data in the book, uh, the 77 images in the book, um, very few. Um, and so I, what I did find Find, though is uh, that th as Anna Marie uh, Ross uh, died of exhaustion, the number of cases of exhaustion not leading to death seems really, really high. And it makes sense when you realize that soldiers uh, and sailors, um, they could get a furlough. Granted, it's nothing like it is today. Um, but a soldier could get a furlough, um, or at the end of their term of enlistment, they could take some time off before they rejoin the army. Nurses, and I think this is fair to say based on my research, they just worked until they were literally dead. Uh, and then they take a little bit of a break, go home, and then come back. Some never come back, but it seems like most of them do. In 1864 in Washington, um, they create, uh, I believe it's the Sanitary Commission that forms a home to take care of these women who are exhausted or need help so they can have a place to relax for a while. Wow, uh, I, yeah. I, I hadn't heard that before. That's, yeah. I mean, I, I have no trouble believing it and certainly that there was a need. Yeah. Uh, and, and you think about it, um, you know, in terms of today and in, the, uh, in terms of the pandemic, I mean, the, the yeah. first responders and the nurses and things being, you know, on the, on the front lines uh, like that and just, you know, working these mind-boggling shifts, um, yeah. you know, in the, in the COVID wards. I mean, um, yeah. thing, things like that do still sort of linger on today. Absolutely. And when I was watching all the coverage um, over the recent months, especially early on in New York, uh, I, you, you can't help but make the connection to all the women in this book, what they went through, what they lived through. Um, it's just the parallel was just, um, for me, I, I, I thought about it constantly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of great questions in the comments. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, Paige asks, um, if there's a place online um, 
that uh, uh, to send people to the the pamphlet for um, Nurse Bacon that you mentioned earlier? Um, I can find that and uh, and we can put it on the uh, on the Facebook page. Um, sure. I yeah, had to it, do. Yeah, it's it, it's one of those. Uh, archive.org or um, Google Books uh, digitized versions uh, that I found. Sure, yeah. If you just send me the link, Ron, I'll make sure that winds up on the museum's Facebook page. Good. I'll do that. So, uh, Paige, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, th thank you, Paige. Uh, Barbara asks, uh, I've heard about uh, scraping lint from tablecloths or sheets. Uh, was this lint turned into bandages, or was it uh, more used for packing wounds? Uh, I, I, from what I read, it was used for both and everything and anything. Uh, folks are sort of recycling um, whatever they can to make whatever they can. And uh, I'd also add that in addition, on the subject of recycling, lint, um, uh, we have a story. Uh, it's um, Marianne uh, Bickerdyke who um, uh, is recycling clothing um, because the, she gets concerned that all these uniforms are being thrown away um, that are in sick wards. So she starts boiling the clothes to cook them and to get rid of the, the diseases that might be lingering in them. Uh, and I, again, thinking about today uh, and the pandemic, uh, reusing masks. Uh, some of the technology they've been, or some of the processes around that made me think of her work. Yeah, that, that, that is uh, a, a cool connection. Yeah. Um, and uh, let me see here. Uh, Robert asks uh, if we can get Ron's book at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine bookstore. Uh, and I <laughs> believe the answer is yes when it eventually comes out. Uh, but we do yeah. have a few other uh, a few other of Ron's books uh, for sale. So if you uh, email our, uh, the bookstore at store at civilwarmed.org, uh, you can, um, might be able to get that out to you via mail. Or if you come into the museum, which for those of you that weren't here, uh, mm -hmm. we will be reopening on a, a limited basis um, from Friday through Sunday, starting June 26th. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're very excited that that's uh, coming up. Uh, and also uh, we will be open or we will be available during business hours all seven days a week. But if it's not Friday, Saturday or Sunday, you'll have to uh, call in or uh, make an appointment uh, for more details and all that. You can go to our go to our website. Um, let me see here. And uh, if we didn't get to your question uh, in the comments, um, go ahead and, and send send me uh, an email or contact Ron directly. I think what well, what's a good way to get in touch with you, Ron? Uh, you can find me. I have a, a website, uh, my author website, RonaldSCoddington.com. Uh, um, I mentioned the magazine, Military Im Images Magazine. Uh, my email uh, is easy, militaryimages at gmail.com, uh, and of course Facebook. So I'm pretty easy to find online. That's right. He, he's, he's out there. And also, uh, I, I'm a zero inbox kind of guy. So if you email me, you will hear back from me because I hate a cluttered email box. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I can, I can relate, uh, relate to that. Um, any uh, final thoughts or uh, uh, closing words as we kind of come to the end of our time here today? Yeah, um, I, would, um, uh, I would encourage uh, all of you first, I, I want to thank everyone for tuning in today um, and thank John. John, thank you for um, being such a gracious host and also uh, to the museum for being uh, equally gracious uh, in inviting me. So I truly appreciate the opportunity. Um, and as someone who has visited the museum, I can't say enough great things about it. It's really an eye-opening place. And Frederick, uh, now that they're opening, the restaurants and all that, um, you certainly can go, I think, and uh, have a nice time of it. So um, I would say though that um, my journey with learning about these nurses um, has really opened my eyes in a different way about um, an essential part of the Civil War period. And I keep coming away with this idea that the heroism and the courage uh, of these women to leave their homes 
when they didn't have to. I mean, it was perfectly acceptable for you to stay home and make lint bandages and send them off. Um, but these intrepid women who, for them, was not enough. They wanted to do something more. For them to meander down uh, into the unknown, into something that was disorganized and not particularly, not an easy situation, and to find their way um, is it was some, it's something that will stay with me for the rest of my days. And if you get a chance, um, whether it's through my book, um, through the museum, however, however you are able to uh, afford and access the materials, I urge you to get to know these women. Absolutely. Uh, that's, uh, th that's the plan and I hope you all um, take them up on that. Uh, and perhaps you can even use uh, our website, civilwarmed.org as a resource. Uh, I did. We have, <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Uh, we have uh, some of their stories up there. It's certainly not exhaustive, um, but uh, there's a lot of great information online uh, about Civil War nurses. Um, thank you all so much for watching today. Um, if you haven't already decided to become a member and you've enjoyed either this video or some of the other programs we've done, it would mean the world to us. Uh, and we really appreciate those of you that have become members. It's, uh, it's been such a blessing uh, for us. Uh, and if you have recently become a member, you can take advantage of that by coming into the museum and getting your free admission uh, and a discount in the bookstore. Um, so that we're going to be opening up this upcoming Friday. Go to our website, civilwarmed.org, for all the details about what that's going to look like. We're going to have your safety primarily in mind. So uh, we're confident. The only reason we're opening is that we're confident we can do so safely um, for not only ourselves, uh, but for you, the visitor. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to seeing you in person, uh, perhaps as soon as next week. Um, but never fear, uh, these videos will continue. Uh, initially, we're going to start going down to uh, two a week starting in July, uh, and then uh, well, we'll go from there. Uh, but, but, but we will keep doing these videos just in case anybody is, uh, is concerned. So thanks so much for tuning in today, everyone. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, this is Ron and John signing off.